Hello. In this lecture, I'll present an essential tool, the notion of a map of chain complexes. Reflecting the algebraic and geometric nature of chain complexes, these maps can be thought of as both continuous and linear. These maps will allow us to talk about things like observable properties, subobjects, and diagonalizations. In some sense, this is an instance of a, quote, categorical approach to structural complexity. This approach will help us see a chain complex as a unified geometric object with a rich algebraic structure. The geometric properties will help us generate new ideas, applications, and guesses. The linear algebraic structures allow us to test guesses and scalably implement applications. However, to minimize prerequisites, I won't explicitly use the language of category theory. Instead, I'll give a somewhat bizarre introduction that will hopefully streamline the transition to a more categorical approach to the subject. I should emphasize that if you want to use these methods for anything beyond cookie cutter off the shelf applications, you have to learn how to integrate categorical thinking into your understanding. As before, I'll begin with a motivational example. Recall that I can linearize, aka one hot encode, any map of sets. This gives a matrix whose ijth entry is 1 if the map sends i to j, and 0 otherwise. I'd like to do a similar maneuver, but with a map of directed graphs. First, I should mind y'all what a map of directed graphs is. A map f from gamma to gamma tilde is two pieces of data, a map between their set of vertices and a map between their set of edges. These two maps must interact in a very particular way. Namely, f evaluated on the source of an edge, E, must coincide with the source of f of E. Similarly, f evaluated on the target of an edge, E, must coincide with the target of f of E. Note that these conditions give something akin to a finite criteria for continuity, as failing to satisfy this condition is like saying you're ripping an edge in half. Ripping is definitely not continuous. A nice exercise is to figure out how to see the data of a node or an edge or a click or a node with valency 5 or a bipartite structure as a map of graphs. As in the case of sets, we'd like to construct a map on the linearizations of these graphs. We do this by just one hot encoding the map between the vertices and edges. Note that the boundary of f of an edge is equal to f of its boundary. In other words, f, quote, commutes with the boundary maps. In summary, f extends to a map which is linear and, quote, continuous. This continuity condition is modeled with the condition that f commutes with the boundary map and held because the map of graphs was continuous. Personally, I like to think of this map as like the derivative of this map between graphs. So let me enumerate the data and conditions present in just a general map of chain complexes. A map of chain complexes F from V to W is the data of, for every single degree I, a map Fi from Vi to Wi. In particular, it sends vectors of degree K in V to vectors of degree K in W. Moreover, f must send the boundary of v in v to the boundary of f of v in w. As with graphs, I interpret this condition as a continuity condition, so that I can think of a map of chain complexes as a continuous linear map. Not all matrices come from one-hot encodings of maps of finite sets. The same is true for maps between linearizations of chain complexes. Here is an example coming from uh, concatenation. This is a map F between chains on the following two graphs. The source of F is just an edge, and the target is two edges glued together along a vertex. The edges are oriented from left to right. F sends the outer vertices to outer vertices, and the edge to the sum of the two edges of the target graph. I claim this is a map of chain complexes. To show this, it suffices to perform a simple computation. Feel free to pause the video and see if you can do the computation yourself. And here it is. Note that this map was, quote, continuous due to a beautiful cancellation. 
A final exercise is to try to convince yourself that this cannot be constructed as a linearization of a map of graphs. So let's begin with a question. What is the data of a map out of the linearization of an edge? Well, it's just two elements in V0 and an element of V1. However, these maps need to be sufficiently continuous which means that the boundary of the element of V1 must be the difference between these two elements of V0. Hence, we should think of this data as like a path in V. Now let's say we're given two quote paths in a general chain complex V so that the start of one is the end of another. This is precisely the data of a map out of the graph I constructed above. I can pre-compose this map with the map I constructed on the previous slide. I'll leave it as an exercise to convince yourself that it makes sense to compose a map of chain complexes in the obvious way. Notice that this is simultaneously adding and concatenating the edges. This gives a more geometric interpretation of addition. This extends to higher dimensions. Um, I won't get into it since uh, mortals really, in my opinion, need the theory of operats to formally make sense of concatenation in higher dimensions. In higher dimension, there's a very interesting space of concatenation. For example, in dimension two, it's the circle. Uh, NumPy's axis attribute for its concatenation method is a shadow of this fact. Before going into the next example, I need to introduce one of the most important chain complexes, R bracket K. In degree K, it's just R, so that the degree K piece is one dimensional, and it's zero in every degree not equal to K. Note that this means that the boundary operator is forced to be zero. Since this lecture is about maps, let's see if we can understand the data of a map from R bracket K to a general chain complex V. Note that the only possible non-zero linear map must go from the degree K piece of R bracket K to the degree K piece of V. As R bracket K is one dimensional, this linear map is determined by its value V at quote one which is a vector in VK. As the boundary of one inside of R bracket K is zero, the boundary of V must be zero. A cycle of V of degree K and say that R bracket K quote co-represents the data of a cycle of degree K. You should think that if K equals one and V were chains on a graph, a loop in the graph or maybe linear combinations thereof determines a cycle of degree one. What about maps out of R bracket K? So I'll leave it as an exercise to convince yourself that there is a bijection between maps from V to R bracket K into the set of linear functions on VK satisfying the following condition. Namely, it has to send V and V plus the boundary of tilde V to the same value. Note that as this map was linear, this is equivalent to the condition that it sends anything expressible as the boundary of something to zero. As above, we'll call such a map a co-cycle of degree k, as it's like a cycle but in the opposite direction. For example, let's say that we have a co-cycle phi of degree zero on a graph gamma and two vertices v0 and v1 connected by an edge e. Then the equivalence above shows us that as phi was a cocycle, phi of v0 equals phi of v1. Therefore, the function phi doesn't vary as one moves along the edges of the graph. However, phi need not be constant as it can take different values along different connected components of the graph. Instead, it's only, quote, locally constant. This notion of a linear map packages a lot of stuff you might be familiar with from calculus. Let's see this in a concrete example. Let's say we're given a path gamma in Euclidean space. We can integrate vector fields along this path, obtaining a number. This operation is commonly referred to as a quote, line integral along the path gamma, and it interacts with the curl in a very particular way. Recall that we packaged the linear objects of multivariable calculus, namely vector fields, smooth functions, gradient, curl, and divergence into a single chain complex written as omega superscript bullet of R3. The identities between these operators precisely state that this data is in fact a chain complex. 
In this particular example, we'll focus on the piece of this complex corresponding to vector fields situated in degree minus one. I wanna think of this process of taking a line integral as a map from this chain complex into R bracket K, as we're focusing on vector fields situated in degree minus one and maps of chain complexes preserve the degree, this should be R bracket minus one. This whole degree business probably seems opaque right now, but it's not random. Eventually you'll develop an intuition. With this data in place, we can ask the question, when is integrating along gamma a map of chain complexes? By our previous identification of maps into R bracket K, we only need to ask when the following equation holds. Recall that the fundamental theorem of calculus relates an integral of the derivative of a function over a region to an integral of that function along the boundary of the region. Therefore, integration is a map of chain complexes whenever gamma has no boundary. In other words, when it's a closed loop. Although this articulation might seem unnecessarily complex, it definitely constitutes a best practice. Here's an example of when this complexity becomes useful. Namely, gauge theories underlying the standard model and many condensed matter systems. In this language, A is referred to as a, quote, gauge field and constitutes the degrees of freedom of the system of interest. As everything we're doing here is linear, A is in particular an abelian gauge field. A photon is an example of an abelian gauge field. In this language, F is a, quote, gauge transformation. Just for some motivation, Recall that changing the energy function of a system by a constant number doesn't affect any measurable quantities of the system, as the forces are in terms of the gradients of potentials. Similarly, in gauge theory, there's no measurable difference between a system in state A and a system in a state A plus DF. It's merely a convenient representation of our description, not the physical system we're attempting to model. Therefore, the condition of being a map of chain complexes is protecting us from making physically meaningless distinctions which might mess up counts of degrees of freedom. Ken Wilson introduced a minor variant of this to quantum field theory in an attempt to explain the formation of hadrons from quarks. It's called the Wilson loop observable. Of course, Ken Wilson was interested in non-abelian theories, but whatever. This is a significantly easier example to solve and hopefully gives some idea of why this area is useful in systems whose interpretation is uh, subtle. I'll end with a picture of a higher dimensional example of a map obtained as the linearization of the map which collapses an edge of a triangle into a single segment. First, try to see if you can write down this map explicitly. Then see if you can intuit how that formal thing you wrote down corresponds to the picture on the right and how this picture encodes the fact that this map was quote continuous. And that's all for today. Next time I'll go through even more examples of maps. Talk to you later.